So now that we've talked about the implementation part of the command pattern, let's go ahead and look at other considerations. So what are some of the benefits of applying this pattern? One of the nice things it does is it abstracts the executor of a service. And that makes programs more modular and flexible because everything has a common interface. You can plug and play. You can queue these things up, as we'll talk about in a second. You can bundle the state and behavior into an object. So for example, if you're doing a GUI program, you can have menus that are commands, and you can make those commands be easily pluggable, and they all have an execute method. And when you want to run the menu item, you just say execute the command that's stored at that location in the menu. You can also make things flexible to forward behavior to other objects, as we do with our tree context, as we'll talk about later. You can also extend the behavior using subclassing. So here we have our user command impl, and then we can come along and, and tweak this in order to be able to uh, add different kinds of behaviors here. And something else we can do, which we, we don't talk about right this moment, but we'll talk about this later when we get into the, the template method pattern, there's the way of being able to pass command objects around as parameters. So we'll see when we talk about the template method pattern, um, it has this factory method, which we're going to talk about next, that makes the appropriate command based on the user input. It then puts that into a user command object, and then it passes that user command object into the execute command uh, portion of things. And that goes ahead and will forward the uh, call to be executed based on whatever type of command we made. Is it a format command? Is it an expert command? Is it a, a macro command? And so on and so forth. And that'll become clear, the connections between those things will become more clear when we talk about template method. Note, by the way, and it's a very important observation, that these patterns are now working together. So we're using a factory method to make a command, and then we can execute the command, and that's all being done in the context of the template method pattern, which is decided to make a command followed by execute the command as a template method. And we can change those behaviors through subclassing of the input handler class. And this is really, really cool. And it once again demonstrates this concept of high pattern density. In my experience, when done properly, high pattern density is an extremely valuable way of organizing your software because almost everything you're doing is driven by some pattern. And if the people who are maintaining your code, including you years later, know what those patterns are, then you'll be able to uh, do a better job of understanding the, the reasons why the design is done a certain way and therefore not screw things up when you make changes. Uh, it's actually kind of funny. The code that we've been looking at here is something I actually wrote probably 15 years ago, or if not before. And as I go back through it nowadays with the benefit of another decade or so of experience and learning more about C++, I keep finding all kinds of things in my code where I'm like, what was I thinking? That was so dumb. Um, so the code gets better over time. But the patterns have stayed pretty much the same. What's varied has been my choice of C++ features because C++ keeps evolving and there's newer and better ways of doing things over time. Another nice thing about the command pattern is you can compose commands together to yield macro commands as we saw when we were doing the example for succinct mode where you had a bunch of different sub commands in order to carry out evaluating an expression. And, and those can be treated just like any other kind of command. That's it's really cool. It's very recursive. In fact, in, in a bit, it's kind of like the, uh, it's a bit like the composite pattern we talked about before. So you can think of macro commands as being examples of composites. Some other things you can do, we, we don't really do this in our example, but it's very common in practice to have arbitrary level undo redo operations where you can take a command and you can unexecute it. And then if, That'll undo whatever you did. And then if you decide, whoops, I really did want to do that, you can re-execute it. Uh, and so that's another very common set of features. And I think I mentioned before, there's tons of examples of that with uh, Microsoft Office tools and GNU Emacs and many other things that, that have interactive editing sessions. Of course, there are always potential downsides. You can end up with lots of command-derived classes that are uh, you know, sort of trivial. They don't do much other than just override the, the execute method. And so some languages make it easier to deal with that by using things like Lambda functions or Lambda expressions in order to avoid the need for doing all this 
unnecessary subclassing. You may also end up having to store a lot of state to do arbitrary level undo and redo operations. Uh, there's a joke, I, I'm a big fan of GNU Emacs, which stands for extensible macros. Uh, people sometimes joke that Emacs stands for eventually munches all computer storage because it has basically infinite undo and redo operations, which believe me, come in very handy, but can also take up a lot of space if you're not, uh, if you don't shut your editor down from time to time and re restart it. Some other things to think about when you implement this pattern, do you want to copy the contents of the command before you put it on a history list? Maybe so, because if you don't make a copy, then by the time you go ahead to undo or redo something, the state may have changed in mysterious ways, so that can be confusing or doesn't work. You also have to be careful. Some computations don't undo and redo with the same behavior as you do the operations and reapply them and unapply them. So a good example of this would be um, floating point arithmetic with error accumulation. So if you multiply and divide high precision floating point numbers, you may get rounding errors that eventually end up uh, causing, causing issues because you don't get the same precision when you undo or redo something. Uh, less of, of an issue for other things, but very important for mathematical operations. And another consideration is, do you want to support transactions? Do you want to make things whereby something will work guaranteed and undo guaranteed, even if the program were to crash? And um, typically, people don't go to heroic lengths to make history lists survive across crashes or even across shutdowns. Um, some programs, of course, need that kind of very high reliability transactional behavior, but you have to decide whether it's worth it because <laughs> it can be expensive to implement transactions for these kinds of things. There are lots and lots and lots of known uses. Pretty much any kind of user interface program uses command. Um, like I said, menu-driven programs usually use commands for the menu item processing. Um, GNU Emacs, of course, uses them. Microsoft Office. One of my favorite examples from everyday life as a Java programmer is the Java Runnable interface. If you're familiar with Runnable, it's a very simple interface. It has a single method called run that takes no parameters and returns no result. And so it's a clear example of a command. It's also an example of something called a functional interface in Java, but that's uh, a story for another day. So you can subclass or you can implement rather Runnable and be able to define its run hook method to do various kinds of things as a command. You can also use runnables in conjunction with thread pools and threading mechanisms to implement a variant of the command pattern called the command processor pattern. And what that does is that packages up a piece of application functionality in an object and then makes it usable in a different context, typically a different thread of control within a process, although you can also use command processor to send requests across the network to be executed by some other process on some other computer. And uh, there's lots of so-called message passing middleware or message queuing systems, networking or distributed message queuing systems that use command processor as a, a very, very popular pattern. You'll also find this used in places like Java with the executor service framework. And you'll also find it in Android with its ability to use something called the handlers, messages and runnables framework, which is basically command processor on steroids in the context of Android. So to wrap up, command ensures that users interact with the expression tree app in a consistent and extensible manner, and we get a uniform means to process all user requested operations. Now, right now, we've just been focusing on commands from the command pattern point of view, but later when we get to the state pattern, we'll talk about how to ensure commands show up in the right order to preserve the protocols that are necessary to have semantically meaningful sequences of commands, but that'll come a little bit later in the course.